Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Randy Zimmerman. I'm one of the chief engineers here at Titus. Today's webinar is going to cover terminal unit selection using Teams selection software. Our Teams selection software is available for free download from our website. No passwords or anything are required. Once you get it loaded on your machine, you'll see that it's got a lot of very useful functions. One of them is the quick select function. I use this all the time. As you can see, there's a variety of products we can choose from. We can choose a terminal unit, we can choose a fan coil, we can choose a grill register or diffuser, an air handler, a displacement ventilation product, or a chilled beam. Today we're going to look at terminal unit selection. Now, of course, the simplest unit to select would be a single duct VAV box. So let's go ahead and make a selection there. Here at Titus, in our terminology, an ESV is what we refer to as a, a single duct terminal unit. And you'll see that you have a selection of different ESVs to choose from. The first letter in the model name indicates the type of controls that are going to be on the unit. A DESV would be a unit with digital controls. A PESV would be a unit with pneumatic controls. An AESV would be a unit with analog electronic controls. And uh, we've also got some extended size units. These are expanded casings. That's the extra S on the end of the DESV-S. Now, you probably don't see too many projects these days with pneumatic controls. Maybe if somebody's finishing out a floor of an old hospital or government building, they might still need pneumatic controls. Uh, analog electronic controls are kind of a niche product where you want to add a few zones of control and you don't want to tie into any kind of a building automation system. So it's kind of a handy product because it's easy to install. But for large projects, most people are going to want the DESV. They're going to want the digital control. They're going to want all the reporting capability and monitoring capability that you get with a digital control system. So for large and new buildings, this is what I would expect to see. So if we make a selection on a DESV, we can either use an auto select and let the, the program select the size for us, or we can pick the size ourselves. I'm going to go ahead and pick a size 8 unit. That's going to be a unit with an 8 inch round inlet duct. Now if you look at the, the picture over here of the single duct VAV box, there's a few things to know about the way it's configured. First off, they normally have round inlets. Uh, round inlets, we know, are going to be the most efficient way to deliver air to the zone because, as I like to tell people, uh, air is round. Uh, sometimes you can have an oval inlet uh, or you can have a rectangular in it when you put air in a rectangular inlet, it turns into an oval shape. We pioneered this type of unit way back in the 1970s with a round inlet and a rectangular casing. The purpose of the rectangular casing is that it's usually sized to be at least twice the cross-sectional area of the inlet duct so that as air passes over the damper, it expands to fill the casing and that gives a static pressure regain. This lowers the static pressure requirement to move design air to the room. And then the rectangular discharge is also handy for connecting our locally fabricated ductwork because we're going to want to tap into the sides of that ductwork for our diffusers and tapping into a flat panel is going to be easier than tapping into the side of a round duct. So that's why you see the round inlet, rectangular case and configuration on single duct VAV supply boxes. Now if we know the design airflow to our room on a design cooling day, which would be the warmest day of the year, if we know that's going to be 700 CFM, we can go ahead and put that in as our design primary airflow. Then we also need to put in a minimum airflow. We always know that we've got to meet minimum ventilation requirements these days in accordance with ASHRAE standard 62.1. Now the, the amount of ventilation we're going to need on a 700 CFM zone is going to vary based on the square footage and or the type of room and the occupancy in the room. But if we make a guess that it's going to be a 20% a minimum airflow, then we can go ahead and put in 120 CFM for our minimum airflow. Next you'll see on the screen there's 
the primary inlet static pressure and it defaults to one inch. So that's a one inch water column pressure on the inlet duct. That's pretty standard in VAV systems today. Now if this box is going to have water coils or something like that on it, we might need more than an inch of static pressure. But one inch is a pretty good default for a VAV system. Next up you'll see downstream static pressure. Now downstream static pressure is the static pressure drop between this unit and the room that it's serving. So this is going to be the static pressure drop created by the discharge ductwork, the diffuser takeoffs, the balancing dampers, flex duct, and then the diffusers or grills on the end of the duct. So the program defaults to a quarter inch of uh, downstream uh, static pressure. That's a pretty good guess. That seems to be the preferred number that most engineers like to use. In real life, we generally don't really have a quarter inch of pressure drop after the box, but by selecting it a quarter inch, it makes sure that we're covered. Because basically, we need to have enough inlet static pressure to overcome the pressure drop of the box, any associated coils, and that downstream static pressure if we want to be able to deliver design air to the room. Now, uh, we might have to increase that quarter inch to something else uh, if we know that there's going to be some obstruction downstream. For instance, if we're trying to move air through HEPA filters or something that puts a lot more restriction in the airflow, we might have to raise that, that quarter inch. Now, we've got some other options down here. One would be attenuator, and it asks us yes or no. Now, an attenuator, in our terminology, is usually referring to an integral attenuator. An attenuator is usually just lined ductwork. So if you select yes for attenuator on this option, it's going to give you an integral attenuator on the unit. That basically extends the rectangular casing by two feet of length. That basically just exposes the airstream to two feet of line duct. Now, an attenuator is a device that normally reduces sound levels. Now, the amount of sound level reduction that you'll get from this optional attenuator really is determined by the type of lining that you select for the box. Uh, since this is all one piece construction and that integral attenuator is just an extended length on the one piece casing, the type of liner we select in the box determines what, if any, sound reduction we're actually going to get. Now, if we select a liner like half-inch fiberglass or one-inch fiberglass, uh, those are going to give us some sound reduction in discharge sound levels. If we go with a foil-faced liner like our Sterilock or a dual-wall liner like our Ultralock, we're not going to get a discharge sound reduction because they're not going to give us much sound absorption. Now, let's go through each of these liners. First of all, we've got half-inch fiberglass and one-inch fiberglass. Those are the traditional liners in our industry, and those are often referred to as dual density or matte-faced fiberglass. If you've ever seen the material, it has a hard crust on the inside and then a soft inner core. That hard crust is formed by compressing the fibers and putting an acrylic additive in there to bind them together. That is done to resist air erosion because we don't want fibers being peeled off and eroded over time. So a half inch fiberglass liner is said to have an R value of 1.9 and a one inch fiberglass liner has an R value of 3.9. Now next up you'll see we've got Sterilock. Now Sterilock is where we take rigid fiberglass ductboard. That's rigid fiberglass with a scrim reinforced foil coating on one side. And uh, rather than use it the way it gets used in ductwork, we flip it around backwards so the foil faces the airstream. Then we glue it inside the box and cover all the cut edges with galvanized Z-brackets and some foil tape to seal them up. Now this was really the preferred lining for critical environment boxes as far back as the early 1990s. We are starting to see a move away from that type of lining for hospital boxes, boxes that go in laboratories, boxes that go into clean rooms. We're starting to see more of a move away going to dual wall construction, which is what we refer to as ultralock. Ultralock is one inch dual density fiberglass covered with solid 22 gauge galvanized sheet metal. 
So you've got a dual wall box. Now obviously a dual wall box is not going to give you any sound absorption, but by putting that extra layer of metal in there, it does give us a higher transmission loss through the casing, which on certain types of terminal units like single duct VAVs could give us uh, lower radiated sound levels. The next liner option you see is no liner. That's where we put no exposed lining materials on the inside of the box. Now, we're making the assumption that somebody's going to come along at the job site and externally wrap this unit because the purpose of a liner, there's really uh, two purposes for a liner. The first purpose is thermal protection. It's uh, helping us get our heating or cooling to where we want it to go without too much loss to the surrounding environment. The acoustical advantages we get from a liner kind of vary with the type of liner, so there isn't always an acoustical advantage to a liner. But if we go with a no liner option, somebody's going to have to externally wrap that ductwork so we don't get thermal losses and we don't get condensation on the outside of an unlined duct. Next up you'll see we've got uh, options for fiber free lining. Now the fiber free lining as we currently offer it is available in a half inch thickness and a one inch thickness. Now fiber free lining is actually the material is called engineered polymer foam. It's got some very interesting characteristics. First of all, it absorbs no moisture. It has no ability to absorb moisture. It also has a, an antimicrobial chemical agent throughout the material. So if I were looking at putting boxes into an, a tropical environment, for instance, a place where people have a lot of problems with moisture and mold and ductwork, I would definitely want to go with a fiber-free material. The fiber-free lining has some very interesting properties. It can't absorb any moisture, which means anyone who is selling this type of material needs to mechanically fasten this material inside any boxes where it's going to be used as lining. So for that reason, we actually apply this material with a hot melt glue and we allow it to get tacky to hold the material in at first. Then we come back with weld pins and secure the material mechanically. We want to glue the material so that air can't get back behind it, but we want to rely on the mechanical fasteners to hold it in place permanently. This is not a material that's suitable for gluing only because organizations like OSHA limit the types of glues that manufacturers can use in their factories. And those glues usually have to be water soluble for safety reasons and a water soluble glue is not going to work very well at all with a material that can't absorb moisture. Next up you'll see we've got another lining option and this is called EcoShield. Now this is unique for Titus because we have an exclusive contract to distribute this material in the HVAC industry. This EcoShield is actually recycled cotton fiber. It's basically denim. When a new pair of blue jeans are cut out, there's scrap material that falls out. That material gets chemically processed to make it fire retardant and antimicrobial and then we permanently affix a facing to the front and we have it available in either a cloth facing, it's kind of a synthetic material called lye shield, it's almost like a nylon, or we have the option for a scrim reinforced foil facing. This material is unique in the industry. It has uh, thermal properties very similar to fiberglass in the same thickness. So the half inch thick eco shield has an R value of 2 and the 1 inch thick eco shield has an R value of 4. Now we get a lot of questions about lining materials. There's a lot of different reasons why you might want to use different materials on different types of projects. One of those questions that comes up is if you have a lead platinum project coming up a lot of people want to know what kind of lining material would be suitable in a project like that. Basically, if you look in LEED, it says that the entire duct system must comply with ASHRAE standard 62.1, which is the ventilation standard. And if you look inside 62.1 under Section 5, Systems and Equipment, you'll see that all exposed lining materials must comply with UL 181 with regard to resistance to air erosion and resistance to mold growth. Every one of the liners that we offer 
meets UL181, and that's because like any reputable manufacturer, we purchase all of our lining materials from companies that make lining material. No manufacturer would want to make a lining material that doesn't comply with UL181, or nobody would actually be able to legally use it. So to answer the question, what lining material is suitable for a lead platinum building, the answer is everything we offer can go into a lead platinum building. You can put exposed fiberglass into a lead platinum building. Now, I point out that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. We've been moving forward for many years trying to eliminate fiberglass from our products. We know that fiberglass is an irritant to skin and eyes. You know, the fiberglass companies will tell you that fiberglass doesn't harm people, but any material that you can rub on your skin and say, hey, that itches, or why do I always put on a dust mask before I go up in the attic, everybody knows that fiberglass is an irritant. So that's why we've been trying to make the move away. That's why we have our fiber-free material. That's why we have our eco-shield material, because we're trying to give people alternatives. So I would point out that our Eco Shield material is available for the same price as fiberglass. So, for little or no upcharge, you can deliver a non fiberglass product and presumably provide improved indoor air quality and comfort for the life of the building. And if you can do that, there's no reason why people shouldn't be doing that. Anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and make our selection with a standard half inch fiberglass lining. We'll go ahead and hit calculate and it gave us a size 8 box. It gives us a minimum static pressure drop through the box of 0.02 inches. That means that it takes 0.02 inches of static pressure to move 700 CFM from the inlet to the outlet of this box with the damper wide open. Now you can also see that it gives us our sound levels. It gives us a radiated sound level of NC24 and a discharge sound level of NC31. Now, NC24 is pretty quiet because usually the quietest spaces in an office building are usually conference rooms, and conference rooms are usually specified not to exceed NC30. So I would expect that I could install an NC24 VAV box over the ceiling of that conference room, and I wouldn't expect to hear it at all. It ought to be completely inaudible. Now, just for a little bit about acoustics. First of all, NC30 is about as quiet as you'll ever find a room unless you do soundproofing on it because of environmental noise breaking into the room. And if you ever want to select a product so it's absolutely silent in a given environment, pick a sound level for the product to make it roughly 10 NC points lower than the surrounding environment. So if I wanted to be absolutely sure that I wouldn't hear anything in an NC30 room, I'd usually pick a product for NC20 or less. I happen to think that NC24, which would be the worst case on this VAV box, you're not going to hear it in an NC30 environment. It's just going to disappear into the background. Now, you might wonder how I, how I size this box for a size 8 inlet at 700 CFM. And that's because my magic rule for sizing inlets is to try to size the inlet for a maximum inlet velocity as close to 2,000 feet per minute without going over by much. And I happen to know that a size 8 box has an inlet area of 0.349 square feet. So if we take 0.349 times 2,000, that comes right up to 700 CFM. So I use size 8 boxes right up to 700 CFM. I also know that a size 6 box has an inlet area of 0.196 square feet. So uh, I use a size 6 box right up to 400 CFM. I use a size 10 box right up to 1100 CFM. The reason why I, I do that, the, the way I came up with that 2,000 feet per minute, I know that if air isn't moving through the ductwork at more than 2,000 feet per minute, I shouldn't be self-generating any noise. Now in our industry, we're allowed to go as high as 3,000 feet per minute velocity, but most people would never want to do that. Uh, some people go as high as 2,500. I like to limit myself to 2,000 feet per minute so that I keep my static pressure drop through the unit low and I keep my sound levels low. But I don't want to fall into the trap of oversizing my inlet duct. I try to keep it as close to 2,000 
so that I don't have to worry about turn down at the low end. You know, if we oversize the box for the maximum flow rate and uh, then start turning the box down to a minimum flow rate, we can get to the point where the uh, signal on the inlet flow sensor gets so low that it's hard for the controller to read it. And that can result in controllability problems and hunting. I try to avoid that by putting my maximum flow up as close to 2000 as possible. I can have a nice comfortable 85% turn down without getting into any kind of controllability issues. Now let's say we wanted to go ahead and add a reheat coil to this box. We can go up here and pick a hot water coil. Uh, you'll notice the first thing that happened is it gives me an option for another flow rate now. Now we had a 20% minimum flow rate for ventilation. Let's say we wanted to have a 40% heating flow rate. So our box would go from 700 CFM of cooling design down to 120 CFM of ventilation. Then it's going to open back up to a 40%, which would be 280 CFM during the heating mode. Uh, whenever you're doing a single duct box with a reheat coil on the box, you definitely want to have at least three flow rates that you're working with. You want to start out at cooling design, go down to a cooling minimum or ventilation flow rate, then back up to a heating flow rate. That's by far the most efficient way to do that. Back in the old days with pneumatic controls, the box is typically modulated from the cooling design down to the heating, and that was very inefficient because it caused us to sub-cool the room before we had to heat it back up again, which was a huge waste of energy. Now, if we go ahead and select the coil, we've got different analysis methods that we can use here. We can select this coil based on the MBH that we want to deliver. We can do it based on the leaving air temperature that we're looking for. We can do it on a combination of the MBH and the, the GPMs of water flow, or the MBH and the water pressure drop through the water line. We can also go with leaving water temperature or GPM. I typically, I'm typically going with the leaving air temperature. And we need to be very careful about our leaving air temperatures. I see a lot of situations where people have excessive leaving air temperatures, and that can easily lead to comfort issues in the space. ASHRAE recommends that the leaving air temperature from overhead diffusers should never be more than 15 degrees higher than the desired room temperature. So if you were trying to control a 75 degree room, you wouldn't want to discharge air from a ceiling diffuser any warmer than 90 degrees. And the reason why ASHRAE makes that recommendation is for efficient heating and improved comfort. You know, the hotter the air is coming out of the ceiling diffuser, the more it's going to tend to stick to the ceiling because of buoyancy. You can improve comfort in the space by delivering air at a temperature closer to the room temperature. So by limiting the leaving air temperature to a 15 degree delta T, that promotes good room air mixing so that we get thorough mixing from our ceiling diffusers. That eliminates stratification. You can tell if you've got a stratification problem in a room if you sit down and you feel cold and then stand up and feel like you've got a fever. You've basically got layers of air at different temperatures in the room and that leads to thermal comfort problems. So we want to definitely limit our leaving air temperature. Now our program here defaults to a leaving air temperature of 95 degrees. That's the old ASHRAE guideline. If we go with the newer guideline, then we're probably not going to want to have a leaving air temperature ever higher than 90 degrees. So we'll put in 90 degrees and uh, we've got 180 degree entering water. Let's see what kind of selection we get here. Okay, so it's come back to the same size 8 box like we had before. It's got a the minimum air pressure drop, the minimum static pressure drop has increased from 0.02 inches up to 0.17 inches. And that's because that's the amount of static pressure drop we're going to get delivering the design air 700 CFM from the inlet to the outlet with the damper wide open, including the water coil. So now we've got the air pressure drop of the water coil included in our results. You'll notice also that adding the water coil changed the, the radiated and discharged sound levels on the unit. The radiated sound level went from 24 
now it's 23. So it actually improves the sound of a single duct VAV box when you add a water coil. And that's because it puts pressure drop downstream of the damper, which forces the damper to a slightly more open position, reducing our damper noise. And you'll see the discharge sound went down from NC31 to NC29. Now if we go look at the detailed results on our water coil performance, you can see that it's telling us we have a one row coil with 280 CFM going through during the heating mode, and that's going to give us 10.6 MBH, and of course an MBH is thousands of BTUs per hour. The GPM, the water flow, is 2.8 gallons per minute. The box leaving air temperature is the 90 degrees Fahrenheit that we ask for. Our leaving water temperature is 172.2 degrees. Our water pressure drop is 3.98 feet and our air pressure drop of the coil alone during cooling design airflow is 0.15 inches. Now let's say that um, we don't have 180 degree water. You know, that's a big problem that we're seeing these days is we used to be that the design temperature for water was typically 180 degrees, but nowadays with modern condensing boilers, a more typical water temperature is going to be 120 degrees. Now, of course, we need the same amount of heat as before, but uh, having less entering water temperature to work with is going to change what the requirements are for this box. So let's go ahead and reselect at 120 degrees. And I can see that it made a big difference. If we go back to the general data here, our air pressure drop with no coil was 0.02. With a one-row coil, it was 0.17. Now, with a three-row coil, we're up to 0.49. That's a pretty hefty air pressure drop. Of course, our, our radiated sound went down even further, you know, from NC24. Now we're down to NC22. And our discharge sound went from down from NC31 all the way to NC28. But, uh, of course, we got this three-row coil, and three-row coil is generally bad news for most people. Most engineers don't like to see more than a two-row coil on a job because they don't like to be punished by that high air pressure drop through the coil because that's going to cost you all year round. So that's usually to be avoided. One thing I should say about coils, as long as we're talking about numbers of rows, it's not always uh, common knowledge. But in terminal units, and definitely true of our products, our one and two row coils are cross-flow circuited. This means that there's no difference in performance with regard to direction of airflow. This basically allows these coils to be flipped over in the field to reverse the location of the connections with no change in performance. Once you get into a three or a four row coil, it makes sense to take advantage of the added depth on the coil, and these coils are therefore counterflow circuited, so we bring the water in at the leaving air side of the coil so that the warmest water is in contact with the warmest air to give us the highest efficiency on our heating. But like I said before, most engineers don't want three or four row coils on a job due to the air pressure drop. So we do have a cure for that here. You'll notice there's another uh, selection we can make called FPI. That's fins per inch. That's how many aluminum fins per inch on the face of this coil. Standard coils in our industry have 10 fins per inch, but some manufacturers offer 12 fin per inch coils. Some manufacturers call that a high capacity coil or a high performance coil. Here at Titus we just call it a 12 fin per inch coil because that's what it is. Now 12 fin per inch coil can come in very handy because adding just a few more fins per inch gives us a slightly higher air pressure drop but not nearly the added air pressure drop of a, of a whole other row and certainly not the added cost of a whole other row. So if we reselect this unit with our 120 uh, degree water and a 12 fin per inch coil, as I suspected, going from 10 to 12 fins got us from a three row coil back down to a two row coil, which is going to be much more acceptable to, to most customers. And it's also going to get our air pressure drop down. 
you see it went from 0.47 back down to 0.36. So that's a, a 0.11 drop. That's definitely a very worthwhile improvement. So the point of this exercise was to show you that with 180 degree water, we got a selection with a one row coil. With 120 degree water, we got a selection with a three row coil. But when we changed our coil from 10 fins per inch to 12 fins per inch, we were able to drop back from a three row coil back down to a two row coil. Now let's take a look at something else here because we have another type of heat we can talk about. We can talk about a selection with an electric coil. Now when we're selecting an electric coil, uh, we would typically go with the same kind of airflow rates we would as if we had a hot water coil. And we've got fewer selection methods here. Uh, we've got, we can either select based on kilowatts or leaving air temperature. And again, we default to 95 degrees. I like to knock that down to 90 degrees. Now we also have a choice of the type of coil we're going to have. We can either go with steps or we can go with an SCR coil. Now stepped coils have been used since the beginning of time. Uh, basically you usually have your choice of one, two, or three steps or stages. Back in the old days with pneumatic controls it was important to the more kilowatts you had in the heater, the more steps you wanted because you wanted to break the total capacity into more steps so that you would spend less time overshooting your heat requirement. Nowadays with digital controls it's usually unnecessary to ever go up to a three-stage coil. Usually a one-step or two-step coil will give you very accurate control because modern digital controls uh, use PID algorithms. That's proportional integral and derivative control. And that allows the controller to not only take into account the amount of offset from set point, but also the amount of time that the offset has lasted and the rate at which the room temperature is changing. So a modern digital controller doesn't have to wait for the room temperature to drop outside of a, or pass through a dead band before it kicks the heat on. A modern digital control will notice that the room temperature is dropping and, and it will decide that it should turn on now to prevent the room temperature from going below set point. And then it can also decide to turn the heat off before it overshoots the temperature. So modern digital controls take into account timing and can use that timing to anticipate when to turn on and turn off so you're not going through these constant uh, overshoots through uh, various dead bands. But really the ultimate control for an electric coil these days would be an SCR coil. Now SCR stands for Silicon Controlled Rectifier and they got a bad name for a long time because these these heaters used to be very expensive and used to be very unreliable. That was back in the 1980s and 1990s. When you buy an SCR heater today, whether it's ours or any of the competitors I can think of, even though it's called an SCR heater, SCR heater doesn't really stand for the old silicon controlled rectifier heater anymore. SCR has come to basically be a generic term for a modulating electric coil. So when you look inside today's SCR heater, uh, you won't find an SCR in there. You'll find a digital control board and that digital control board fires low voltage solid state relays rather than using old SCR technology. Those solid state relays are confusingly enough referred to as SSRs. Solid state relays have come a long way in recent years. They've come way down in price and gone way up in reliability. A solid state relay has no moving parts and nothing to wear out. They are silent. They can switch on and off as quickly as one hundredth of a second so it can give you very precise control and it basically flashes full voltage out to the elements in a certain pattern to create a certain percentage of heat capacity at a given moment. Now some people would be are terrified when they hear that full voltage is being flashed on and off by these relays because they imagine that it would create a lot of electrical noise in a building, a lot of uh, electrical noise 
That actually doesn't happen because solid state relays are zero crossing devices. They basically switch on and off as the nice smooth sine wave power passes over the zero point. So that eliminates the problems that people fear would happen. Uh, we've actually never heard of anyone having any electrical problems due to these heaters in their buildings. So anyway, if we were going to do a selection for a unit with 90 degree leaving air temperature, 55 degree entering air temperature, and we've got uh, 280 CFM as our heating flow rate, we can make a selection here. Oops. Uh, it's asking me... Oh, I'm in the wrong selection method. Going with leaving air temperature, I selected 90 degrees. See, even I make mistakes. All right, uh, so we've got our selection here. It came up with an 11.9 uh, MBH, which corresponds to 3.5 kilowatts. Gave us a leaving air temperature of 94.5 because uh, this program works in uh, increments of 0.5 kilowatts. So it gave us a little bit more heat than we wanted. Can you, all, you can also see that it gave us our our electrical schedule over here. This is the MCA and the MOP. MCA stands for minimum circuit ampacity. It means that everything in the circuit supplying this this unit has to be rated for 21 amps or more and it also says the maximum overcurrent protection is 25 which means that the maximum recommended circuit breaker for this unit would be 25 amps. Now let's go back and uh, look at a different type of box. We can do a selection on a fan powered box and of course the formal name of a fan box would be a fan powered terminal unit. Uh, we can see here that there's many different models here. Uh, you'll see that most of the names end in a P or an S and that's because uh, regardless of all the different models that are out there all fan powered terminal units can be divided into basically two families there's the parallel fan powered terminals and the series fan powered terminals. Now these two types of units can be distinguished by the location of their blower and how they operate. The series fan powered box has a fan that runs constantly throughout the occupied mode and has the blower located at the discharge of the unit. That means that all of the airflow going to the room goes through the blower on a series fan powered box and no air can be moved to the room when the fans not running. That's very different from a parallel fan box. A parallel fan box has a blower that is set back inside the unit and the primary airflow travels around the blower. So the blower is off during the cooling mode and only switches on for the heating mode. The fact that the primary air travels around the blower means that it moves in parallel to the blower and that's why this is a parallel fan powered box. Now when, when the, these boxes are in the cooling mode they basically behave like a single duct VAV box. Since the fan's not running and we don't want to lose that primary air to the ceiling plenum Parallel fan boxes are always equipped with a backdraft damper that closes to seal off the blower so that primary air can't leak out through the blower into the ceiling plenum. Now let's make a selection on a, a series fan powered box and we'll go with the DTFS. That's kind of the commodity series fan powered box that we offer and it's asking us to put in a design primary airflow. Let's say it's going to be a thousand CFM. One thing I'd point out would be that sometimes people get into selection difficulties when they're trying to select fan boxes that are either too small or too big. I sometimes have people asking me, why don't you have a fan box that moves 50 CFM? Well, I personally wouldn't put a fan box in the ceiling if the fan is only going to move 50 CFM. There's really no point in putting another blower and a motor and pulling an electric circuit over to it. You'd be better off going with a single duct VAV box. Also, we get in situations where people are looking for a fan powered box that moves 5,000 CFM. That's basically a mini air handler. 
I typically don't like to see fan boxes handling much more than 2,000 CFM each. Once you start going over 2,000 CFM, you're creating kind of a concentrated noise source above the ceiling, and that leads to other problems. Now, in a series fan box, it's typical to have the design primary airflow matched to the fan airflow, and that's what our program does. It automatically assumes. Usually the only time you'd want to have a difference would be if you had the fan airflow slightly higher than the design primary airflow because your primary airflow was colder than 55 degrees. For instance, if we had 40 degree low temperature air coming in and we wanted to do a little bit of blending with our return air at all times to bring up our leaving air temperature, we might have two different flow rates there. But in 99% of our applications, you would see the same airflow for the design primary and the fan. Then down here we've got to put in a minimum cooling CFM. Let's say that's 20% or 200 CFM. Now we've got our primary inlet pressure once again defaults to one inch of uh, pressure. Now that might be appropriate for a parallel fan box, but for a series fan box, a series fan box actually acts like a booster on the air handler. So I see a lot of people operating uh, series fan boxes as low as half an inch on the inlet pressure, and that can allow you to save a lot of energy at the air handler. You know, a series fan box acts like a booster on the air handler because the air handler just has to deliver primary airflow to the inlet of the box. Then the box fan picks it up and moves it the rest of the way to the room. That's a lot less work for the air handler than on a parallel box where the air handler has to move the air to the box, through the box, and all the way out to the room. Again, our leaving our downstream static pressure defaults to 0.25 inches. I find that you rarely have 0.25 inches downstream. It's often less than a tenth of an inch because people tend to over-design their discharge ductwork, but I usually just leave that at a quarter inch to make sure I'm covered. Next up, we have a choice of fan motor. Either go with a standard fan motor, which is a PSC fan motor, a permanent split capacitor motor, or we have the option of an ECM. Now ECM stands for electronically commutated motor. It's a much more high efficiency motor. The PSC motor uh, is said to be 20 to 60 percent efficient, and the more you turn down the speed control on a PSC motor, the closer you get to 20% efficiency. ECMs, depending on who you talk to, have a minimum efficiency of 70 to 80%. So an ECM could be anywhere from 10 to 50% more efficient than a PSC fan motor. Also, ECMs have a longer service life. These are ball bearing motors. It's a higher quality motor. They tend to last two to three times the uh, service life of a PSC motor. PSC motor usually lasts uh, 10 to 12 years. The ECM is going to be uh, 20 to 25 years service life. Now if we go ahead and make a selection here, you're going to see it comes up with a whole bunch of different fan cabinets. Uh, the fan cabinet size is the letter and then the inlet size is over here. Now, like I said before, I usually like to use a size 10 inlet right up to about 1100 CFM. So I'm probably going to want to have one of these 10 inch inlet options. If we picked a size C, uh, let's look at the fan curve. See where we are on this cabinet. That's pretty high on the fan curve. I generally like to pick ECM boxes in the lower 50% of their range because one of the odd things about the ECM is the efficiency actually increases as you turn down the speed control. So being up this high in the fan curve might be a little noisy and uh, we could save some energy down lower in the fan curve. So it, let's go down here and look at a size D10 and see where we are there. This is probably a much better selection. I know that the size C and D are the same size fan cabinet, so we're not going to be penalized with an overly large unit, but we're going to be in a much better operating point from a, probably a noise and an efficiency standpoint. So I would prefer the size D for this selection. So we'll go with a unit size D with a 10 inch inlet. Now if we look at the sound data here, 
This unit size D has a radiated sound level of NC31 and a discharge sound level of NC22. Uh, so that looks really pretty quiet. Now if we had a situation that was sound critical, like a conference room, and we didn't want to select an NC31 box to go over an NC30 conference room because it, it would be audible uh, being at the same sound level or near it and it would contribute some sound. We have another option for a quiet version of this box. That's called the DTFS-F. So you'll see that we right now we've got an NC31 and an NC22. If we go with the, the phantom version, as we call it, of this box, and make a new selection, we come right back to our unit size D. We dropped our radiated sound level all the way from NC31 all the way down to NC20. And our discharge sound went from 24 down to 18. So this is you know, an 11 point drop in radiated sound is huge. And uh, we achieve that with our uh, pull out sound attenuator. There's also some other changes inside the unit. Uh, the Phantom unit uses a different inlet assembly that has a built in silencer. And this pull out sound attenuator ships inside the unit. It pulls out. The Phantom box has the lowest radiated sound levels for a box its size in our industry. So we definitely recommend this unit for sound critical spaces. Uh, real quick I'm going to do a selection on a parallel fan box just to uh, uh, give you some pointers here on uh, where people run into problems selecting these boxes. If we had that same 1000 CFM primary airflow that we had before, now, on a parallel fan box, the fan airflow shouldn't match the cooling design. Uh, usually, I expect the fan airflow to be anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of the cooling design because there's an old rule of thumb out there that says it usually takes twice as many CFM to cool a room as it does to heat a room. So let's say I'm going to assume we have a 600 CFM fan airflow. We've got that same 200 CFM primary minimum airflow. We're going to have to put our, our inlet static pressure back up to one inch because uh, remember this uh, parallel box does not boost the air handler. So the air handler's got to move the air to the box, through the box, and all the way out to the, to the room. Although we offer the ECM option on parallel fan boxes, depending on where this box is going to be operating, it might be a long payback for the ECM. The ECM is, is not an inexpensive option. Therefore, most people are going to go with a standard PSC fan motor for a parallel fan box. I once had somebody from South Florida ask me what the payback would be on an ECM, and I said, I don't know how often you actually run the heat in Florida. You might never get a payback. Anyway, if we make a selection here on our TQP, that's our parallel fan box, with our standard fan motor, We've come up with several choices here. We've got a unit size 2 with a 10 inch inlet, a unit size 3 with a 10 inch inlet. Those are probably going to be our, our two best choices. Let's look at the fan curve on the size 2. Well that looks like trouble because we are right on the maximum curve. There is no room for error here. And one of the things that sometimes the trap people fall into is that the parallel fan box, when the fan is running, the primary minimum airflow is still going out the same discharge duct, so that puts a little bit more air pressure on the discharge, and that can back the fan down the fan curve a little ways. Uh, being right on the fan curve here, I would not want this at all because I also know that balancing contractors are usually using balancing hoods, and depending on the type of diffusers they're reading, those hoods could be reading low by 20%. And if you are already got the fan maxed out here, uh, you could be in for a world of trouble. I would not select right there. We go look at the size 3 unit. Now that's not a great selection because it's it's kind of low in the efficiency for a PSC fan motor, but you got all the room in the world here for adjustability. I would say that both of these are, are kind of problematical. 
Let's take a look with an ECM. Now we've got more choices here. Let's look at the size 3 with the ECM. That's kind of up above the midway curve. Size uh, 4 with a 10 inch inlet. That's a very, a very efficient operating point. I tell you what, I kind of like this operating point better than anything else I've seen. I'd probably go with a DTQP size 4 with a 10 inch inlet. Well, I hope that um, you've gotten some, some helpful tips by checking out this webinar. Uh, you'll see we have a whole library of webinars out there to, to try to help you out. and We can continue to add to the library. Anyway, I hope you consider this worth your time, and I uh, wish you a productive day. Thank you very much.